Uh, good afternoon. I'm Phil Tolkoff. I'm a member of the Baltimore Museum of Industry's Board of Trustees, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this afternoon's program on the era of industrial food. Uh, being in the food business myself, this one is uh, definitely- Oh wait, you know what? I'm sorry. My program's, the program's starting. Can I call you back? The program's starting. Okay, bye. For all those not familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we're located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We're dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Our building once housed the Platten Company Packing Company, which opened in 1865 to can oysters, as well as fruits and vegetables. Our cannery exhibit tells the story of those who worked in the cannery and the impact that canning had on patterns of food consumption. Programs like this one are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you're currently a supporter, thank you. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org. Your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're looking forward to today. Now, just a bit of housekeeping. This is a meeting, not a webinar, so your cameras and mics can be turned on or off. Please keep yourself muted unless we're speaking, you're speaking. We encourage you to participate by asking a question using the chat feature or when the presenter pauses for questions by speaking over the mic. This program is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. I'm pleased to welcome Kara May Harris to lead today's presentation. For more than 10 years, she has been documenting her journey to find, cook, and eat historic local recipes on her blog, Old Line Plate. She also maintains a Maryland recipe index with over 32,000 listings. You can find her website at oldlineplate.com. Now over to you, Kara. Hi, um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I've put together a presentation that kind of goes on a lot of tangents and then is a little rambling. Um, I'd like to keep questions to the end. So if anything catches your attention that you wanna ask about, um, certainly feel free to bring it up to elaborate on later. Um, and you can always reach out to me also. So after the presentation, because I never get tired of talking about this stuff. Um, a little background on me, um, in addition to what was just said, I collect these cookbooks. Oh, let me get on the slideshow. I collect these cookbooks from Maryland. I make their recipes. I do research on the people and the places behind these different recipes um, and the ingredients, the food culture of Maryland. Um, in doing so, I've learned that Maryland food used to be famous across the Western world. Um, there were people who would come to Maryland, to Baltimore, to dine in our fancy hotels and try these different famous specialties like terrapin and canvas back duck and deviled crab and a lot of dishes that we might not even know about or have access to today. Um, a lot of people don't think of Maryland as being the South per se, but the important background of our food culture is that this concept of luxury hotels and dining really did evolve from our legacy of slavery. We had this culture of um, caterers who were often formerly enslaved people or you know, descendants of enslaved people who helped create this food culture in Maryland that in, um, in effect, it, influence the industry and the home cooking. So the main thing I am interested in is home cooking. A lot of recipes that people made at home didn't necessarily make it into cookbooks. People cook intuitively. A lot of people who made cookbooks were wealthy women who would fill these cookbooks full of <laughs> fantasy food that they'd make for their guests mm. or maybe never even make at all. So they don't necessarily represent the full picture of food culture, of what everyday people would be eating in Maryland and elsewhere. So in order to try to do more research on the real food that people were eating, um, I, would, I started doing a lot of research in newspapers. And this is when I came upon the dark side of Maryland food history. There's practically no dish um, that I've done newspaper research on that I have not found someone who died from eating it. Um, vegetables, ice cream, beverages, inevitably you find these stories of food poisoning. In the early 1900s, people had very little idea what was causing this. They didn't really know 
how to detect it and how to stop it. Um, the term tomains is used here just to mean toxins of um, food that's kind of decaying, but it also kind of became a catch-all for some of the other circumstances that would lead to food being, being dangerous. Um, people getting sick from adulterants or even occasionally intentional, uh, intentional poisoning, um, which we'll get to in a minute. So this was a very chaotic and dangerous situation surrounding food at the turn of the century. And then into this situation, we add mass food production. Um, as BMI patrons know, Baltimore was really an epicenter of canning and developing technologies in order to preserve these foods and then uh, preserving the food that came in through the ports and through our, um, you know, through our state's bounty, um, things that were harvested here. So I started to think that maybe this canned food revolution saved a lot of lives by taking out this factor of all this mystery tomains and um, death and creating food that was consistently safe to eat. Then I began to learn that corporate processed food, uh, pardon the pun, but it opened up a whole other can of worms. Um, I knew there were problems with adulterants and fraudulent food merchants um, watering down their products. This 2018 book, The Poison Squad, by Deborah Bloom really opened my eyes to the scope of how rampant and brazen the problem really was. Um, one item in particular that I found a lot of mayhem surrounding would be ice cream. It's a very obvious vehicle for adulterating. Milk goes bad pretty easily. And then ice cream, it's sweetened and it's cold. So you can mask rot, you can mask um, different adulterants like formaldehyde. Um, newspapers ran stories about how this uh, danger of ice cream or other street foods was caused by immigrants because they're dirty. Uh, the ice cream trade associations would jump on this because they don't really want these street vendors selling this product. You know, our, our uh, famous handlers, for instance, financed a little bit of this crackdown on these hokey pokey men who are just killing children across the country. But it wasn't just street vendors and sanitation that were making ice cream dangerous milk was actually being preserved with formaldehyde and it was making people sick and killing children. So there's a lot of suspicion all around. The food industry was in kind of crisis uh, before the pure food law was passed in 1906. Here we have some clips where canneries are blaming their foreign workers on their unsanitary conditions and candy manufacturers color their candy with toxic chemicals. So children, this would be sold directly to children. And then we have different defenses that it's safe to eat crab or it's safe to eat oysters that um, are in waters that are filled with sewage because this is the late 1800s and these oysters are filtering out water and lots of dangerous things. So in addition to all of this, I've also found a lot of stories of people being suspected of intentionally poisoning someone with food. Sometimes these stories made me wonder, excuse me. Some of these stories made me wonder if these were all necessarily poisoning or if it was just bad luck based on all these other X factors that we have going on and false accusations. This particular story up on your screen right now is a pretty famous one where a couple eventually they found subsequent evidence the papers were keeping up with this over a bunch of months it was very high profile story that originally started with suspected food poisoning and evolved into where a jury thinks that the victims were intentionally poisoned um, they ultimately found the suspects that they couldn't determine that it was necessarily them who did the poisoning but this is just one example of I was just trying to research smear case on here. And I came across this whole world of trajectory just based on someone eating something and getting sick and dying and it turning into essentially a Baltimore scandal of the year. This was in 1911. So when I find stories like this, I often, I just have to follow them and find out where they go. So my research kind of goes all over the place um, based on starting with a food item. And so many people died from these 
tomains that the dangerous preservatives like formaldehyde, they might have seemed like maybe a good alternative when they were first introduced. Um, people were also preserving food with borax and salicylic acid. There weren't established ways of determining whether these ingredients would really harm people over time. Um, and again, you had so much rampant, sorry, cat. Um, you had so much rampant indigestion and food poisoning is pretty easy to cast doubt onto what exactly was making people sick. So corporations took advantage of this situation before the pure food law was passed. You had companies bleaching flour with nitrogen peroxide. Um, people would die. Um, people would dye wheat, you know, with clay or something and sell it as ginger, burned shells being sold as pepper, charcoal and sawdust sold as various spices and a lot of honeys and jams were just dyed corn syrup. Um, and big brands were doing this. There's a case in 1916 where McCormick actually got in trouble for essentially watering down their pepper with some kind of plant shells. Um, you can look up the court case because it's humorously, it's called the United States versus six barrels of ground pepper. Um, so uh, McCormick got fined for this, for allegedly not selling a product that was 100% pepper. Um, the situation was so, so rampant that uh, the Heinz company actually built its whole reputation by marketing the fact that their ketchup was made from tomatoes and preserved without chemicals. At the time, a lot of ketchup was apparently made from pumpkin or leftover fruit and vegetable scraps that were pureed and then just dyed red. So people really didn't know what they were getting when they bought a bottle of ketchup until Heinz kind of touted the purity of their product. Um, of course, the outrage around this started as well eventually, and soon laws were being passed to make food safer. Companies began to market their purity and cleanliness as part of their brands. So this is when you start to see a lot of photos of these factories showing everyone in crisp white uniforms with clean floors, making sure that everything's clean to give the consumer and you know, the market in general an idea that these canned foods were safe to eat. Um, and in other instances here, we have a product named Cotyline that's pretty much being marketed solely on the basis that it won't make you sick. So it's sort of, the industry kind of pivoted to this. Um, Good Housekeeping Magazine famously touted itself, uh, you may have heard of their seal of approval. They touted itself as a guide to help women make these choices for their family. Um, Cause at the time it was really considered you wanna feed your family wholesome food, which in addition to being food that's nutritious and uh, will help your you know, your husband succeed and your children grow, um, obviously that also entails food that won't kill them. So uh, Good Housekeeping had tested a lot of these products and um, actually had a man who would approve which ads ran in the magazine based on products that he approved of. So this is, they also published recipes. Um, this is where industrial food and recipes kind of start to cross paths and go hand in hand. Women at this time were compiling community cookbooks, which is my favorite thing. I have a collection of a lot of these books. Um, they were used to raise funds for churches or different social groups. They're my favorite because they have a lot of names of the people contributing the recipes. You can see a lot what people wanted to show off about themselves. Um, the women who compiled these books were actually very marketing savvy and they incorporated new technology. They solicited ads. Um, this is an example of a chafing dish, which is, if you look in any cookbook from the area, you'll find a section of chafing dish recipes because this device really caught on and women would incorporate recipes and then solicit an ad from a chafing dish manufacturer. Um, the baking powder was a really big uh, recipe that you find a lot of product placement in community cookbooks for. Um, it revolutionized the way that Americans baked, but there was this whole situation where the different baking powder companies, this book here called The Baking Powder Wars, gets into this. The different companies were in a competition where a lot of their marketing entailed pointing out the, 
what's dangerous about their competitors and what's safe about their products. So you had to really convince people to try these products at home with all this scary propaganda going around that this baking powder is dangerous or that one isn't. So home economists would put together books using these products and convince housewives essentially that the products are safe and also have a bunch of really tempting recipes that you want to try that you finally have to give in and try the baking powder if you want to eat this strawberry shortcake that looks so good. I think that goes a pretty long way when you think about it towards getting people to try something new. Um, and baking powder and jello certainly caught on because of these kind of recipes. Um, other, uh, sorry, cat is distracting me again. Um, other ingredients didn't fare quite as well. Um, these are a few corporate cookbooks. Uh, I just put this slide in here because some of the recipes in these books, they say they were actually solicited from local women. So you can see how a corporate versus community cookbook is not really such a cut and dry thing. There's really a lot of give and take in between the two where the product placement makes it into the community cookbooks and then the home developed recipes make it into the corporate cookbooks. Um, so you've probably heard of different heirloom ingredients that we can't find anymore, um, heirloom tomatoes and things, but something that me really interested in personally is extinct industrial ingredients. This is a cookbook, a somewhat community cookbook, a church cookbook that has an entire section in it dedicated to a product called Coraline. Um, from my research, I, as much as I can surmise, this product was kind of made up based on some type of corn processing industrial accident. The corn was steamed while it was being milled and it came out in little curlicues. Um, reading the recipes, I think that the product was something like instant grits. So I tried some of these recipes using instant grits, but I can never really know if it's anything like what Coraline was like because someone might resurrect some heirloom corn and heirloom flour, but the world will probably never see the likes of Coraline again for better or for worse, it's lost to time. This is another cookbook from my collection um, of a company called Delane Brown that was a food distributor located, if you're familiar with Station North, um, they were actually located in the copycat building. So this book contains a bunch of recipes that call for highly specific canned ingredients. Uh, you have to get superb brand Loganberries here, um, Welsh, Purity Cross brand Welsh rare bit and these sweetened cucumber rings to make these recipes. And this is the Purity Cross brand made in New Jersey. You can see again where they're really marketing the cleanliness and they're also trying to have some snob appeal, which is something we don't really associate with canned ingredients today. Um, they say in these ads that the soups were made in their factory by a Parisian chef from the Hotel Ritz in Paris. So. Um, the concept of what canned food was really going to be, I think, was a little bit different than maybe how we would think it played out. Um, but on the other hand, if you've made tomato soup at home, you know that it doesn't taste like canned tomato soup. And if you've tried the different brands of canned tomato soup, you know, they don't taste necessarily like each other. So there are a lot of tastes like this that are just never going to grace our tables again. And that's something that I kind of find fascinating. They may be best lost to time, but regardless, if you're one of those people who likes to try everything once, there's a lot of things you'll never be able to try here. Um, and here's one from the BMI slides of just maybe something that was better left, um, left behind in history, but is not something we're going to find on the shelves anytime soon. Um, so these old foods seem like novelties to us, I think. But the thing about food is the way that it works our way, it works its way into our lives um, and kind of acquires meaning to us. And that could be whether it's an heirloom turkey you get or a fresh tomato or the strawberry you grew yourself um, or got at the farmer's market. It can also be the canned cranberries that a lot of people love to have at Thanksgiving um, or, you know, maybe a 
a weird salad or something. Um, this, sorry, this here is actually something that it has meaning to me. This is this uh, completely artificial imitation vanilla butter nut flavor that my family makes a pound cake with um, at Christmas. And I'd mail order this product. And if for some reason it ever stopped existing, my holidays would never be the same again. So some of these flavors might seem funny or unnecessary, but to someone somewhere, you know, they could have been an essential component of something that they like to make. Um, so here's an example of Dream Whip Salad, which this is a product that still exists. I bought a box of it so that I can make this salad, but it's what I would consider to maybe be an endangered ingredient. Um, it was a little harder to find. I had to mail order it and it's a powdered whipped cream mix in order to make this salad. But somebody contributed this to a cookbook in 1983. And for all we know, this could be something they brought to their family picnics and gained a lot of meaning for their family. Um, some, some recipes or ingredients maybe are something even that you didn't like at the time, but is woven its way into your memories and you know, into your dinners. So sometimes I find a recipe in a community cookbook that looks strange or has an unusual ingredient. And I kind of, it makes me want to try it personally. It makes me want to go ahead and get everything to make it all the more. This was a fruit salad with a packet of vanilla pudding and tang mixed in with the fruit. So I know people make jokes about these kind of things, but for all you know, this was somebody's favorite thing to bring to their family gatherings. I don't know. Um, here's a final slide from the BMI provided to me that are obviously products we're not going to probably ever get to try in our lifetime. Canned herring roe was actually a big industry for Baltimore. That was a uh, shad roe that comes in at the spring. Um, and I have other cookbooks that call for this that's in the Delane Brown. So it's certainly something that maybe exists now, but is definitely not ubiquitous and is probably dying out or doesn't taste the same as it did if it was canned using technology from the 30s. Um, we're entering summer and personally, I always get really excited about all the fresh ingredients and the seasonal fruits and vegetables. But I couldn't deny um, that marketing and community, like not all the foods that have meaning to me personally are homegrown. Um, I'm just thankful that I can enjoy these foods safely or relatively safely. So I'm going to uh, end the slideshow here and go to go to questions. So bear with me on Zoom. How's everybody doing? I'll just remind everybody that um, this is a meeting, not a webinar. So feel free to turn on your camera and your mic if you would like, if you prefer to ask questions that way. But I see we do have a couple in the chat, it looks like. Yeah, who doesn't have canned Logan berries uh, on hand? That's a good, you know, the, the, a lot of these things, I'm sure you can find them if you, if you Google, uh, you know, you'll find some example of it. But the fact that this was just something you could go into the grocery store in, Bal uh, in Baltimore and buy. Um, I see a question about Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. And I don't know for Baltimore's canning industry specifically, but it had a sweeping effects. Um, and if you're not interested in the book of the Poison Squad, there's also a PBS documentary made of it. And they talk a little bit about the jungle and how much it, um, primarily regarding the meatpacking industry, which was in the Midwest, that's where the jungle had the most impact and kind of alerted people to the conditions that were happening there. But there was a lot of different things going on at this time, chemists testing out these additives, um, uh, specifically a chemist named uh, Dr. Wiley, who was testing out things that were certainly being used in canneries here in Baltimore. And um, also forcing canneries to label things with the dates they were canned, for instance, there was a lot of resistance I found in the local Baltimore newspapers, a lot of resistance to putting dates on cans, a lot of resistance to putting the weight of the how much product is in the can. So all of these cumulative things had a lot of impact in Baltimore. And then 
as a result of a lot of them, they develop new technology, um, new, you know, new canning and new innovative ways of handling the new regulations. So I don't have specifics, but there's no denying that all these forces affected the way that Baltimore's canning industry operated. And in the BMI collection, there are a lot of pictures of cannery floors where you can tell they're kind of trying to show the sanitary side of things and give people a window into how they were how they were operating. That the fact Kira, that this is um, Kate Livy, and I when oh. I was doing research for my book on oysters, the thing that was like kind of amazing about I you know I had read Upton Sinclair's book as like a high schooler or whatever. And so I thought about it, you know, in terms of the packing industry in Baltimore, you know, and as you know, those were typically sort of seasonal where you go from like tomatoes and fruit in the summertime to oysters in the wintertime. But it was interesting in that the, you know, the, the group of oyster packing houses were so powerful. Um, they essentially were called the oyster vote and they could lobby for different changes that they wanted to see. And they were actually influential in getting the sewer system um, installed in Baltimore after the Great Fire of Baltimore in 1904, largely because there had been a series of, um, you know, people getting sick from canned oysters, and they wanted to kind of regain the confidence of the consumer, you know, body within sort of the Chesapeake area, and then at large, because there was this idea that, you know, Chesapeake oysters could go anywhere the rail could go. And so it was that one example is a really good example of how, you know, in some cases, I think packing houses may have fought industrial, you know, regulation, but in this case, they really sort of embraced upgraded sanitation because you're eating things that are coming out of, you know, the Patapsco or whatever. It shouldn't be full of like human effluent. So that was one like kind of really interesting point how the canning industry sort of changed the, the public, you know, infrastructure of Baltimore. Yeah, I found, um, I had an earlier slide. I know I, crammed a lot of tiny news clippings into some of those, but um, it seemed like it created a little bit of um, almost conflict between Baltimore and DC, you know, because they're, it's the same waterways and sewage from different places is coming into things that are being um, canned and packed here. And meanwhile, there's a lot of scrutiny on the canning and the industrial part of it. So it seemed like there are definitely people who wanted to get this cleaned up so that they could just get everybody off of their backs for their part of uh you know for their role in their product but i saw a lot of things in the sun about assuring people that crab is safe assuring people that oysters are safe to eat because people just didn't really know um and yeah i appreciate your insight to that because it's a really complicated topic i'm a recipe person i have these things all intersect but there's so much to know especially about the oyster industry um, and the massive infrastructure used to can oysters. So yeah, that could be a whole, you know, that could, well, it is a whole book. So I haven't read your book. I'll have to make a note of it. There's so much, so much to read. So thank you for that. I think I see a question about if people become too comfortable with the idea that our food is safe now and I think that's um, definitely the case. I know that I have. I, um, I know that I am, you know, sometimes you make cookie dough or something and you know there could be salmonella in the eggs. And there's a lot of things that we start to take for granted or maybe play fast and loose with. Um, so learning more about history made me feel a little bit more like it's something that I should take seriously um, and that we should appreciate the regulations. I also always wonder what people's sense of taste was like at the time when people were buying spices that were made out of flour and they're eating food that's rotten and getting sick. Um, it makes me wonder if our sense of taste might be a little more finely tuned because I know if something in your fridge is off, you're gonna know when you smell it, um, but maybe the way that you know things were covered up with different chemicals people couldn't detect it or i'm not i'm not entirely sure um so for what bacteria are we talking about with tomaine poisoning um i'm not a bacteriologist but essentially it's the um like the putrefication and the rot of food um i every time i start to look into tomains i 
look that there's a Wikipedia on it that kind of explains it. But a lot of the articles at the turn of the century, they didn't really know. And that's primarily what I'm reading. So the latter day research on tomains doesn't necessarily get drilled into my, my brain, but um, early on, they just knew some, something was wrong. They just didn't know what, and there's articles saying science has no way to detect these things. Of course, just within years, they would have microscopes and they could figure this out. So um, the tomain thing, I've, like I said, I found it to be kind of a catch-all for food going bad. But if you look it up on Wikipedia, it is a little bit more specific about um, specific toxic compounds that come when food is rotting uh, in your fridge or elsewhere. Um, if everything was bland or tasted bad, you wouldn't know what it was supposed to taste like. Yeah, I, I wonder about that. I There's really no way for us to know what people were tasting when they bought this rotting food or this formaldehyde allegedly has kind of a sweet taste, which was a big problem with the milk. Um, I love to believe that I would notice if I drank milk that was spoiled with formaldehyde, but it's hard for us to really know. There's so many other factors. People, a lot of people who got victimized by this were uh, poor people who are living in squalid conditions who maybe already had their sense of smell assaulted by you know, sewage or um, pollutants and things. So, so who knows? Um, did the act of cooking some of the suspect food render it safer? Um, I think that would depend on what was wrong with the food, but I would think so because of ice cream being such a um, death vector. And clearly that's something that people aren't cooking and people are eating directly. And by far out of all the foods I've found, it has the most, uh, like I said, mayhem associated with it. So it would probably really depend on what is making the food dangerous. Um, but I would think that cooking in a lot of cases or even using different, um, some older techniques when you get back before this industrial era where people would kind of preserve food in a ton of vinegar um, and pot things with you know a bunch of vinegar and spices, those kind of would help preserve food and maybe even kill some of the some of the things that are going wrong in the food. Is anyone else? I see some uh, I see some talking, but I can't hear. Uh, anyone? I um, thank Hi. you. It was a wonderful presentation. Oh, um, I had a question that wasn't about food so much, and I mean it wasn't about you know how we were poisoning ourselves or what. But but just as everybody was talking, I did think of that there were cultures that always had to preserve food. I mean, if you think about Iceland or other northern climates, they were very adept at it. Did you find anything in cookbooks, you know, like regional cookbooks where people talked about old methods of preserving food? Um, so I have some of that. And um, to go backwards a little bit, one thing I didn't mention, a uh, factor that contributed to this chaos was really the urbanization mm -hmm. of America. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people were coming to cities and weren't producing their own food. They're mm -hmm. buying food that's been through a whole chain of people and they don't know how it got to them. And our country is kind of figuring out how to feed a lot of people at once um, in a totally new and different way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have some older cookbooks. As I mentioned, something, some old family recipes don't necessarily make it in to a lot of cookbooks, but older preserving methods um, include like something called like potting where they would put it in um, like a clay pot or a glazed container and cover it with fat, um, cook it down so it's kind of an airtight seal. Um, in it, the 1840s, Elizabeth Ellicott Lee, who wrote kind of the first Maryland, the first cookbook by a Marylander that was widely published and distributed, she has a little bit about preserving food in clay jars, but there was actually a risk with that because some of the glaze um, and people were aware of it. She mentions it in her book. Some of the glaze 
in certain types of vessels could be um, could react with vinegars and things that you're using and could become toxic. So people really had to know what they were doing when they were preserving their own food. But of course, we know that people did know what they're doing because every culture has their own different ways of preserving and keeping this food. Um, but it's a lot of the the in, industrialization and people no longer living that way that separated people from their food and started to make things really dangerous on a big scale. You, I, I can ask a question. Um, you had talked about sort of these endangered foods or maybe uh, extinct foods. And I was curious about sort of through your research, uh, like what were some of the common threads that of how a food goes out of style and becomes maybe endangered or extinct? And what you, I guess maybe some of the things that we see that are relatively common now that share those same characteristics, you know? Like what, what are the future endangered foods? Uh, I would really have to think on that. I think a lot of these foods um, that I've pointed out, and even things I've seen from the 1800s, like uh, um, a Maryland cookbook from 1870 has a recipe or two that involve powdered sweet potatoes, essentially instant sweet potatoes. Um, so I think the common thread in a lot of these is that they were foods of convenience. Um, I see, I, we had the slide from the BMI of the pistachio extract from, um, from McCormick that I don't think they make anymore. So that's an example of maybe something that was maybe never very popular, or maybe it's something that gets made now more on an industrial scale for uh, candy makers and home cooks don't use it as much. But a lot of the ingredients that I see in the past, all this canned herring roe, either the ingredient fell out of favor in general, fresh as well as canned, um, or it was a convenience food and we just don't have as many people saying it's Tuesday night and I really need some chicken a la king that I can eat right away for dinner. So, uh, so the factories closed and consolidated and got rid of, phased out some of these products. Um, so it's just, it's tied in with food trends, I think, but also what is convenient for people to do. I see there's some, uh, oh, some, there were some questions about lead um, and a question about correlation between price and the food that was tainted. Um, and in the Poison Squad, they talk about that a little bit. And that was definitely cheaper food. Um, in many cases was more dangerous. Um, I don't go into it too much because we were kind of having a lighthearted talk here, but um, there were cases where, you know, bad milk was sold to orphanages for really cheap and made a lot of kids sick. And a lot of people who bought cheap things were definitely more susceptible to some of this food, uh, dangerous food adulteration. So it definitely, like many things in the industrial world, it affected people disproportionately. Um, and yes, there was lead sometimes in cans um, and lead in some of the pottery glazes. Uh, I see, oh, uh, there was a question about smear case. Um, if you're in Baltimore, you're familiar with that cheesecake uh, that you can get at some bakeries that's made with like it's in German in origin. Um, and I made that a few times for my blog and when I was researching it, I came across that whole murder trial Sorry, I'm trying to balance the, the talking with the chat here. So I'm sorry if I'm jumping all over the place. Um, yes, freshwater eels. I have some old recipes for eels. That was a pretty British thing. Um, people took their eel recipes over here. I'm, that's one that I have no idea why it just stopped being uh, popular. I don't, I don't even see eels. I go to Lexington Market. I don't think I see eels being really available even next to the muskrat. Um, so Sarah, so, I just wrote a rent or a yeah. article on eel. It's called license to eel. The title oh. of the best part, um, BC boys, what? No, anyway. Um, but the whole P it's for Bal just speak Bay magazine and just quickly. Um, yeah. And there's a great new book about eel, but like, I just went out with Waterman to, there's only a handful that still harvest eel in the Chesapeake and they're still using the same technology to harvest them. 
The problem is, is it's the same story with shad and a lot of these other sort of migratory fish that spawn in headwaters is that as we dammed those waterways in the 18th and 19th century, you know, for milling and then later for electro power, um, we just made it so that those populations dropped so much that they were no longer harvestable anymore. And like shad, obviously, you know, would have been this huge taste of spring historically in the Chesapeake. And it's something you talk to like my grandmother's generation and they still remember it being, you know, something they look forward to. But, you know, when, you know, when a fishery gets closed, you stop craving that thing. You stop being familiar with the flavor. And it's sort of like you talk about in your blog so much. It's this idea of like, there's sort of this cultural memory sense through food that we lose that language as those foods don't, you know, become unavailable. Yeah, the shad is a big one that I try to try to bring back in my life because I know my grandfather was a fisherman and he was a big fan of shad roe. Um, so I always, I always try to get it once a year. Um, and now's the time if you're looking to try shad roe. Um, but yeah, it used to be huge. And you saw it was canned. People, um, it was pretty ubiquitous. And now it's a bit of a specialty item. And especially people who are older remember it fondly. But it also has maybe an acquired taste that if people aren't exposed to it for a generation, they kind of lose the taste for it. Um, and there's also a comment about E. coli and cooking, killing off E. coli. And based on, um, we were talking about the jungle and the conditions in these factories, E. coli was almost certainly one of the things that was contributing to this food being dangerous. So that is a good example where cooking things made food safer to eat. I need to try eel. I need to get my hands on a eel. Maybe I should talk to you about the eel. Where can you buy the shad? I get them at Lexington Market. Um, I'm not sure. I think Fadley still carries them. I I work with the family a little bit and I know that they, that's like a point of pride for them, but you can get them in local fish markets. They're just not from the Chesapeake is all. Um, there's one, group of people, there's a, um, a the Pamunkey Native American tribe in Virginia has the last native fishing rights to shad in the bay and they're the last people that can catch them. Um, but you can get shad that's from like Delaware or shad that's from Virginia. Um, oh no, wait, their shad fishery is close to. Um, North Carolina still has a shad fishery, um, but Kira's right, it it's got kind of a liverish consistency like especially if it's if the egg sacs aren't pierced and it's cooked like all in one you know the, the, the sets are cooked um but and I think somebody commented in the um that there are places restaurants will serve it too it's livery and the fish itself is very bony um I read the um John McPhee book book about shed and it just constantly has this refrain of this fish that people relied on but a lot of people just hated it Throughout history, a lot of people hate, yeah, uh, hate shad because it's so bony or they hate the roe because it's so funky tasting. Um, but I, I went to a shad festival in um, New Hope, Pennsylvania, Delaware. It's like straddling a uh, river there. And there was very little shad to be had at the shad festival. They did a fishing demonstration that was really cool, but it wasn't like a traditional food festival where everybody was consuming massive amounts of shad and shad roe. So I was a little bit. A little bit disappointed but it's not it's not something that we would really have to deal with all those bone those tiny bones in a fish and, and the livery flavor of the roe so it's not not it might not be the next big trendy food that's for sure any uh I have another question about, can you, do you see, I'm also interested in community cookbooks. Do you see them, are they still alive and well, or have food blogs sort of taken over the, I'm curious your opinion about sort of like the evolution of community cookbooks and how that fits in with the internet. Yeah, I feel like the internet really put the, um, not the ends, they still exist. I have um, some that are from the 2000s, but the internet really changed the way that people interact with recipes in general. Um, the way that I look at cookbooks historically, 
is that a lot of cookbooks, especially uh, people's handwritten or cookbook collections, um, they're based around foods that people fantasized about eating. We think about people and their um, boards of internet recipes that they're never gonna make as being a modern thing, but that's an age old tradition thinking about food that you'd like to eat and maybe never getting around to it. So the internet kind of gave everybody a more convenient way to amass all these recipes. Um, and at the same time, people don't really go through the effort of compiling these community cookbooks like they used to. Um, someone I know put together benefit cookbook in early kind of quarantine COVID um, that was a digital version. Um, so I have heard about people doing that, but it's so much work. Um, and people put a lot of work into illustrating these books and compiling them. And in some cases, testing the recipes, not all cases. So it's so much work um, that I don't think that the small churches can really depend on putting together a book and having everybody in the parish buy a copy. Um, like you could even in the 1990s. But I could see them making a comeback. I always fantasize about, you know, kind of putting together something um, just because they're, if they don't function as a cookbook, they function as a historical document of the food of a community. So I hope they never go away completely because there's something really precious about that to me. We, we made, made one, one for our holiday party, party at my and my, my office is here, ever a digital one. Yeah, the, um, maybe I should talk to the, the Pratt Library or someone about trying to create a repository for those kind of things, um, because the digital stuff, it's never gonna turn up at a yard sale where I'm gonna find it. So um, hopefully there's some way to kind of collect those and document them for the, uh, for the future. Um, oh, thank you for the kind kind words in the comments. I know I'm very awkward in these talks. And I get winded with my asthma um, and my thoughts run away from me. So I really appreciate it. Um, if you're enjoying my website and enjoying talking about this stuff, I really uh, thank you all for coming out today. Um, was there was there any questions in the chat that I missed? Um, hopefully not. It's hard to do both. Oh, hokey pokey ice cream. Um, that's a uh, that's a good one, um, and can send me on a huge tangent because Baltimore had a really, um, really active street food culture. Um, I read about it in travel journals. People came here, and, and compared to other cities, I guess people ate uh, kind of on the fly in the streets of Baltimore a lot more than in other cities for whatever reason. Um, and that would be deviled crabs and, um, of course, snowballs. But Hokey Pokey is a mysterious ice cream type product um, that was so, seems somewhat like a Klondike bar, basically. Um, an ice cream kind of uh, fleshed out with a little bit of gelatin and milk. Um, so it kind of was ice cream. The recipe, the one recipe I could track down for it that seemed somewhat reliable because it was in a trade journal was ice cream mixed with some um, gelatin essentially to kind of aerate it and cut it into bars and it'd be wrapped in foil and sold. Um, but yeah, I've seen it in England. I think hokey pokey is something entirely different involving like honey, something like that. So it did just become kind of a catch all for these uh, uh, cold sweet treats I think that people would buy. Thank you, Paul, that's very kind of you. Are the restaurants in the area that specialize in old Maryland foods? Um, someone had mentioned the pepper mill where um, I've never actually been. I really need to go um, to go there and just get their shed row, but I don't uh, actually go to restaurants very much. Um, so I'm not sure. I think different places sometimes do their, I've heard of a place that does a spin on Maryland stuffed ham, um, a hotel in town. I actually had been meaning to compile a list on my website to kind of help people find those kind of things like beaten biscuits and uh, lost Maryland foods, but it's going to be a lot of work to keep up with since places come and go. Um, so I can't think of any one place off the top of my head that's really old, uh, old Maryland through and through. You kind of have to go because there's so many different 
cultures and cuisines. So you kind of have to go around the state and try all these different things. It's not really a big catch all. I think that you could go to a restaurant and get the full, full Maryland experience. Maybe if, if someone wants to give me, you know, $5 million, I'll, I'll put it together. So investors uh, come my way. I just double checked. I don't, I think you've got uh, all of the questions you, you were able to respond to. And yeah, I just must echo my uh, thanks because this is just, there's so many different parts to this story. As you mentioned, the, the home cooking and the industrial and the cities. And I mean, there's just, there's a lot going on. So thank you for this really interesting uh, window into Baltimore history. Yeah, thank you all. I, I look forward to coming down and look, looking further at some of those, um, the background of some of those images that we pulled. Because um, the, the, the industry here is so, so complex. I was surprised to find how much of the manufacturing wasn't actually just the canning of the foods, but the making of the implements to can the foods, you know, custom nail machines and um, sealers and things to process green beans. And you look at these trade magazines and it's just like a crazy, uh, you know, just a web of industry involved where we only see the canned food in the end, but so much went into it. And so many workers in Baltimore were involved in every part of this. Um, yeah, someone mentioned the Fenwick Bakery has good non-poisoned smear case. Smear case is a really under undervalued Baltimore food. So I highly recommend uh, everybody follow Rachel's tip and go, go check that one out. That's a good example. Someone asked about Maryland food. The bakeries, you can get the peach cake in the smear case and uh, it's coming in the summer. So now's the time to do that. Um, yes, the Ivy Hotel, that's the place um, that I think they have like a stuffed ham terrine or something like that, that someone told me about. So if anyone tries it, let me know how it is stuffed ham is, I, I won't go on the stuffed ham tangent because we all have places to be this afternoon, so. Well, great, I, I think that seems like it wraps it up, but if anybody has other questions, um, feel free to put those in the chat or contact us and um, appreciate everybody coming today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. And, and yeah, I love it when people reach out to me, so feel free. Um, and thank you for putting this together. Um, do you need anything else for me or are we just all 